I, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about uh, how your creative process for making this work, because y you started in a very different way um, from how you have um, made work in the past. If you could just talk about how you and the dancers like got in the studio and not just started dancing, but some of the other things you were doing. Sure. Uh, this work, uh, I guess like a lot of our works, has a lot of um, collaboration with the dancers, but um, a lot of this work was created uh, in conversation. And more than that, we uh, created a lot of the work um, through the dancers learning um, videos of me dancing. Um, and then I would relay the material to the dancers, and they would learn it. And then we would morph it together to create different situations. So you were improvising and making material. They're learning it from video. But then you also are laying in, layering in some other uh, kinds of activities as well. Yes, we did a lot of uh, workshops um, in various cities, um, sometimes returning to the same place over the course of um, two years, three different times, um, working uh, with the subject matter of love, belonging, and loss, and doing um, memory mapping exercises, and um, engaging with a lot of LGBTQ teens and senior citizens, and um, having conversations about those, those topics. Um, but engaging the company in that conversation so I think it became all the more personal as we went on the, that uh, journey together. I'm going to bring you guys into the conversation in a minute, but Kyle, I just want to—I want to um, pretend that I am the composer, and you call me up and say <laughs> I'm commissioning in a score, but maybe nobody's going to hear it. What, how, how did that go? Uh, I think that's the great thing about Jerome Begin. Um, he's up for, I think, a, a fun adventure. Mm -hmm. Um, Jerome, I think it's the one thing that I know was a challenge was um, because the audience has this choice, uh, it actually uh, limits certain uh, elements of the composition. He had to take out a lot of the crescendos in the music, um, and I know that felt um, like kind of just quieting one of your children or something. <laughs> um, but, uh, you mean so that I wouldn't hear it if I was sitting next right. to you listening? Yeah, there are a lot of moments uh, in various sections that went up a lot more and, and came down in different ways, but we had to get rid of that because there was a lot of noise bleed. Uh, and that change didn't happen until after the, the opening night. Um, he had to kind of stay up all night <laughs> to change the music. Um, but he was up for the challenge. I think one of the harder things was probably for the dancers never having any, any music in rehearsal. We don't even play fun music uh, or any ambiance. <laughs> it's been pretty it's sparse. Such a, it's such a great uh, transition for me to bring you guys into the conversation because one of the things I've been thinking about is that I think for a lot of people uh, in an audience who haven't uh, necessarily danced, that the assumption is that you would not be able to dance with a partner or be in unison. Could you talk a little bit about how, how you find, you each have beautiful duets in this work and yet there's a trio as well, about how you find those moments of unison and, and even and phrasing and timing um, in, in performance? Um, I would say practice, practice, practice. Um, I think, you know, once we get more and more comfortable with each other, I think we start listening more um, and we just find each other. Um, Jeremy and I, like, we face away from each other a lot, but we usually try to, like, really listen to each other since there's nothing that we're <laughs> <laughs> listening to. Um, you know, there's no music, there's no score, so we're just kind of like feeling each other, we're like in it together and really trying to like hone in on the energy that we're feeling with each other. Connie, could you say something about your, your duet um, with, with Matthew? Because it's the first time we actually see that sort of uh, precision and the timing for the two of you in, in the work. Um, and, and I was thinking also that on, a, on one night it might feel like it wants to go faster, and on another night it might want to feel like it should go a little slower, and how you're negotiating that. Um, I like what Tamisha was saying. Um, repetition helps. Um, also, we watch each other a lot, listen to each other a lot. Um, we also try to create this internal rhythm um, in between ourselves. Um, there is a, um, we will create landmarks that we can try to meet here while your leg is up here and while your arm is here. Um, um, and such as the walking, we're walking towards each other um, back to back. Um, we kind of just, we were just practicing right before this this show and saying, okay, we're gonna do one, two, pause, one, two, 
one, <laughs> two, one, two, three. And then we asked Tamisha to watch as we were together. And she's like, perfect. And we're like, okay, that's good. <laughs> So um, I was thinking, there, there's something that, uh, Kyle, you have set up for us in the way that the dancers come into the space and that, and, and that they are revealed to us one by one. Could you say something about, I, I mean, not just your first entry into the space, because sometimes it's a long time till you come back and how it feels to, um, I mean, it's, it's come, some of Kyle's works, you dance straight through for, you know, full out for 45 <laughs> minutes. And then in this work, like you come in quietly, you have some quiet moments, you have some big moments, but then you go away. What's it like for, for you as dancers? I'm really grateful for the break I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, since I uh, perform in the first duet, and it's a lot that's in there, um, not physically, but emotionally, so I definitely need the time uh, just to kind of get out of that world. Um, so the breaks really help me. Um, I usually like try to switch out of it, so I listen to like an upbeat like track or something to just help me get into another world that I have to uh, go into with Jeremy. Um, but yes, I'm very grateful for the break that I have. <laughs> um, for myself, the break, the breaks definitely help me uh, to transition myself into another landmark because I create my own storyline throughout the whole piece. So each um, part that I do, it's a landmark and the break, I try to connect those dots. Kyle, could you say something about structuring the work? You, you, you generated material, they learned material. Um, and, and how did you start to feel like, uh, how are you gonna shape the evening for us? Right, I think um, that's a really arduous task. I think it's something that uh, humbly, I'm always trying to think if it's the right version. Um, even watching it this afternoon, the, the 2.15 performance, I started thinking, oh, I wonder what happens if I try and move these things around. Uh, and that happened throughout the process. Uh, the trio that Connie does uh, was originally um, made for the uh, Marcella woman would have been in that trio. But I thought thematically we liked it with um, Connie, Matthew, and Jeremy, and like the kind of order that that created. Um, but I'm always, I guess, curious to see how it can evolve in a different way. It's also interesting for me to see how the uh, dancers performing the work, living in the work, how it continues to evolve, and the ways in which that story evolves um, makes me question the order in different ways, depending on uh, where they get to as uh, performers. I don't usually like to say that we're performers, but um, as, as people really kind of uh, having that experience in front of me, it's interesting for me to see how that um, transitions from one section to the next and uh, constantly shifting. I'm glad you uh, changed your word from performer to people because I've been thinking like in the program you have a program note that has some candor about you know some things that you are living in your life that had an impact on this piece, and you've asked the performers to come on a very uh, kind of personal journey with you, but also bring their own um, selves into it. So could you just say something? I mean, you've taken on big issues in your work, so these are big issues, but they're also in some ways you can't blame it on the civil rights movement anymore. It's now it's now it's on on you guys to think about your own journeys and how uh, how that's different from other pieces. I mean, ironically, I think it depends on the audience mm -hmm. because there are people that see this work and um, bring race into it in a really sp uh, specific way. That's um, always surprising to me, but I, you know, it's everyone has their own thing. But um, I think I'm just saying yeah. it, it compared to uh, the the works like the Gettin, which were yeah. deliberately um, right. had some other content pieces. Yeah, definitely. I think this project for us. Um, was really about trust in a lot of ways. Um, for me to collaborate with these artists, I think it was important for me to open up fully. Um, I tend to be a really open person, but I think there was a moment in the rehearsal process where I, I realized that there are probably aspects of um, my life that I wasn't as open about that I think were really important for the work to kind of go further. Um, but I think a big part of this has been um, for for the artist to kind of connect to 
their own stories um, while knowing and understanding what my experience has been over the past uh, two years in particular um, of losing my mother and ending a relationship with the person I thought I was going to marry, all these kinds of things that were really shocking. But ironically, I was making this work before any of those things happened. It just, um, I think it, a lot of that brought up um, a lot in the conversations that I think might have triggered other, other um, sources of imagery. So for you as dancers, I mean, Kyle has asked a lot of you as performers always, but in some ways, you're much more exposed in this. I mean, I, the last time I saw the company perform was in April at the Kennedy Center. Like, I was pretty far back, and here I'm watching you walk on and off the stage, and you're um, much more exposed. Could you say something about um, sort of your journey into uh, preparing for this? It's been a pretty long uh, journey for me. Um, I think in Kyle sharing his experiences and uh, also memories that he's, he has, um, it was really helpful for me. Um, I think it was more difficult to bring my own experiences into it because I wasn't necessarily ready to. Um, but I think in order to get to um, a really vulnerable and emotional place, um, I needed to. And once I started um, just kind of tapping into my own experiences and um, just bringing myself into the work more, I think that's when I really found um, myself and I felt more comfortable in the work. Um, so now it's kind of like I'm going along for the ride and just like seeing how far I can go. Um, yeah, and hopefully if I go too far, you know, Kyle's like, okay, maybe not that far, but um, yeah, I just kind of want to really push uh, myself. Kind of you want to add? I think it's really nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, it's just very personal. And <laughs> It's, if I can just add to it, I think it's just a beautiful thing for me to see the openness that um, they're, they've been willing to share with people that they don't know. Um, it's just, it's a real gift. Um, I, I feel blessed every time that I get to see that, that vulnerability and get to see that openness. Um, that's one of the most beautiful gifts I think anyone can share with someone, a friend, lover. Um, that's something that's so much stronger than a performance is just really showing someone all of your, your, your ugliness, all of your most beautiful things, all of those things. Um, so it's just such a gift that they're, um, they put themselves in that place. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a question about your choice in having us seat, uh, be seated on four sides. And, and uh, Mitchell is suggesting that um, the audience has a kind of role as the, uh, of the core, corps de ballet, uh, in framing the dancers. And could you talk about that? Sure. I, I I felt as if the subject matter being as vulnerable as it was, um, was all the more exposing. Um, so there was something about in the round where, um, as our lighting and set designer, uh, Dan Scully would say, you can't hide anywhere. Um, I feel like as an audience, uh, at times you may feel uncomfortable because you, you don't know what to feel or sometimes you want to look away, but you know that people may be watching you from another, another side. I think that's all a part of life. Um, there's so much of this work that reminds me of um, New York and New York subways. And I've seen people crying on the subway many a time while I have my headphones on. And I don't know if I should engage um, or not. Um, but there's something about that experience that I was really interested in, um, but also really scared of, too, because it's usually performed at night. It usually gets really warm in a theater. People tend, can fall asleep, you know, and so I get really self-conscious about that. Um, you know, you're looking across the room from someone, are they sleeping, are they awake? All those things, but I think that's just part of um, the experience that I was, I was really interested in. So this is to ask you to, to speak a little bit more about this, this choice that you've given the audience. Um, to listen to the sound in the room, to the dancers, uh, to the silence or not silence, or listen to the uh, composed score, and and how, why that was important for this work. Sure, this is kind of like a uh, option D answer. I'll give you A through D. Um, 
music is my first love, so making a work about love, longing, and loss, I thought I should lose it. Um, but uh, that's A. Um, B, I wanted to make a work in silence, but was really self-conscious about whether or not I could succeed at that. So there is music. Um, I have gone to the movies in cities other than Los Angeles. I spend a lot of my time in LA now. And LA is one of the only places where you can go to the movies and no one says a word, and I love that. Um, so when I'm in New York, I'm always like, I wish I could just watch this movie with headphones on so I don't have to hear anybody else. Um, so I think all of those things were a part of that um, decision. And if there was uh, somewhere for like another letter in there, I think it's also um, my insecurity about how some, some people in the audience feel like they need music. Um, and so I wanted to give some folks that um, crutch if they felt like they needed it. <laughs>